The Obi-Wan Kenobi Show. Watching this show was about as much fun as 70s kids probably had when their dad helped them with math homework. <laughs> with The Mandalorian Season 3 sputtering into oblivion and the announcement of that Rey Skywalker trilogy, I felt compelled to re-release my original Obi-Wan Kenobi reviews in this compilation video and do a little retrospective. The Obi-Wan show was a missed opportunity to put it lightly, but its legacy is going to be the straw that broke the Star Wars IPs back. Star Wars wasn't doing so great by the time Obi-Wan released in late May of 2022, thanks in no small part to the horrible reception of The Last Jedi and Rise of Skywalker. Mandalorian Season 1 and 2 were relatively well received and was, up until recently, really the only thing Star Wars had going for it. People said absolutely not to the Han Solo movie, Book of Boba Fett pissed on itself, so what better way to bring audiences back than the granddaddy of them all? A show about two of the most beloved characters in the entire franchise, with the last actors to play the roles, and one of the roles being one of the greatest villains in cinema history. To save Star Wars, Ewan McGregor was signed to reprise his role as the pre-New Hope Obi-Wan Kenobi, and the even bigger event was the announcement that Darth Vader would play a major role in the show, played by Hayden Christensen once again, no less. I remember right before the show came out, a friend of mine who is a big Star Wars fan said something I won't forget. This is it, he said. They're bringing back the biggest character in the franchise. If they fuck up with Vader, it's over. What can I say? The man called it. With piss poor production values, horrid writing, serious moments that turned out to be laughable, and uneven acting almost across the board, Obi-Wan Kenobi brought in the viewers at first, but ended up being such a stain on the Star Wars IP that it's hard to see how the series will recover. Just take a look at how the IP has fared since the show. Andor, while being pretty well received, was watched by nobody. Mandalorian Season 3, the one bright spot for some time when it came to Star Wars, has barely registered with viewers and the quality sees the show shitting on itself on Disney+, Plus, which I didn't think they'd find family appropriate, but here we are. There were other criticisms of the Obi-Wan show. The introduction of a new antagonist, which was, let's face it, completely unnecessary, and to focus on Leia's relationship with Obi-Wan instead of a story revolving around Obi-Wan protecting Luke. With Kenobi's entire life from Episode 3 on being about protecting the young Skywalker, the very premise of the television show, Obi-Wan leaving the planet to rescue Leia, is contradictory to everything fundamental about his character. So many fan ideas on how the show could have gone were better than what was actually produced, and that's normally not the case. A golden opportunity to make a small-scale Obi-Wan story in the vein of Unforgiven was completely missed. Mandalorian picked up the Western vibe for much of Season 1, but we're talking about a Jedi living on a desert planet. The man with no name? Come on, it was right there. One could say it was due to the times we live in. Why make a story about Obi-Wan when you can just use his name to draw in audiences and bait and switch mid-season and make the show about some new female antagonist no one cares about? That's as modern as modern writing gets, after all. Turns out, though, if you do that shit, you need to make sure it's a compelling story, the visuals are on point, and the acting is up to snuff. They failed every single one of those requirements, and now Star Wars is reaping the rewards. A dying franchise. As is usually the case, once the show disappeared from public consciousness and the ruins of an IP were left to bear, the general consensus now that the dipshit defenders have calmed down is, the show just wasn't good. Now to revisit the show with the reviews I released as it originally aired. When I put these videos out, my channel had like 500 subscribers, so it was my first introduction to the toxicity that is brought on by the people who love the show. Anyone with a dissenting opinion over this crap fest was called toxic, but my personal experience was anyone defending the show wasn't afraid of wishing me dead in the comments section. So it's kind of like, I'm super tolerant and we're just a happy fan base, unless you disagree with us. Then I hate you and I hope you die. <laughs> Let's go back in time to May 2022. We need to have a serious talk about Obi-Wan Kenobi, also known as the most cringe TV show in recent memory. I'm talking Battlefield Earth level cringe. I honestly can't believe it's this bad. I'd rather rub sandpaper on my face. Do people not see the idiotic plot contrivances? The idiotic character decisions? The terrible acting? Oh wait, yes they do. They just excuse it, come up with fan theories to work around them, or just ignore it and say la, 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 la. whenever you bring them up. Guys, you deserve better than this. I'm not even a Star Wars fan and understand how this show messes things up timeline-wise. Just for the sake of pumping out new content for you to consume. General Kenobi, years ago you served my father in the Clone Wars. Now he begs you to help him in his struggle against the Empire. Guess you forgot he saved you from captors like nine years ago, huh? 
I sense something. A presence I've not felt since. This made it seem like he hadn't seen Obi-Wan in a lifetime. Guess he forgot it was just like nine years ago, huh? The first two episodes were pretty awful, but episode three is where it really steered into Keanu Reeves taking a shit territory. Ewan McGregor must have consumed like 90% of the budget. At least that's what the crappy effects, makeup, and recycled sets would suggest. But even ignoring that, this is some of the most embarrassing directing, writing, and acting I've ever seen in a big budget project. Obi-Wan Kenobi follows the now time-honored tradition of the prequel trilogy with and then storytelling. If you've watched any of my videos, you know this is probably my biggest pet peeve. Things not happening due to natural occurrence, but happening because the plot needs them to happen. This was so egregious that I had to make this video, but it stole me away from my Zack Snyder Ruin DC video. So I'm going to show you with some select examples to paint a picture for you. Your Honor, I'd like to introduce Exhibit A into evidence. <laughs> We have a 10 year old child running away from adults in the forest. Now if you're a good writer, you'd probably show us how she outwits them because she obviously wouldn't be able to get more than 5 feet from them without being captured. But nah, this sequence is more like in a video game when the guy with a gun has to go find a key to unlock a door instead of just blasting the lock off. Oh, there's a branch in the way. God damn it. Good editing can sometimes cover up bad writing, but they couldn't even do that. They used shots that went on too long or over the head shots that show just how stupid they choreographed this sequence. Oh, and don't forget that they decided to hire Flea from Red Hot Chili Peppers for some fucking reason. Where is the girl? She must be close. Doesn't matter. You're not getting out of here. Now let's see how good of an actress the new antagonist is. Surely she'll at least make up for how bad someone like Flea is, right? They can't cast someone cringe as the lead villain, right? I like that one. It's important. Tell me where the Jedi is! Ugh, Jesus wept. Know what's super cool? In the next episode, after she's done imitating the Predator and acting like a poor man's trinity, she does this. I'm not gonna answer it. I don't need you to. Guess she forgot she could do that any time before this, huh? Tell me where the Jedi is, or this man and his family die! Go fuck yourself. If episode one through three were serial killers, Episode 3 would be the Night Stalker, the most brutal and terrifying of them all. What are you doing out here? That's a long story. It's a long way. I just wanted to point this one out because of how funny it is that as soon as the conversation's over, the stormtroopers conveniently get out of the transport truck. Guess it wasn't too long of a ride after all. Definitely not just shitty editing. Are you sure if they've been on this planet? They know what they're doing, Leia. You called her Leia! Whoa! Something cool's gonna happen here! Surely the name Leia will trigger them that this is Princess Leia and that he's the Jedi they're searching for. Something cool's gonna happen! That was her mother's name. I get confused. What? That's what they wrote? Are you fucking kidding me? Do I need to elaborate on how dumb this is? Get on fucked up now! After this, Obi-Wan gets in a tussle with another crew of stormtroopers. <laughs> All right, that was pretty cool. Why are you fucking with the gate? Just walk around it! Now I'll admit, it's awesome to see Vader again, and obviously that's what Disney's counting on you feeling too. I think it's fucking hilarious that Disney kept the theme going of Vader killing kids. <laughs> what the fuck? All right, this looks pretty cool. Right until Obi-Wan does this. So the whole thing turns into a fucking cartoon. And then this next part happens. Now you will suffer. Okay, I'm digging it. Bring him to me. Wait, what? Just force grab him. Wait, why are you letting him get away? You just put out a fire. Put this one out. What the fuck? Okay, so you're telling me that he started a fire, put out the fire, and when another one starts, he can't put that one out? And some three-toed sloth of a droid has time to pick him up and carry him away? What could the reason behind that be other than fucking plot armor? Well, he wants to toy with Obi-Wan. First of all, wrong. Otherwise, they wouldn't have the stormtroopers saying shit like this. Fuck 
yourself. This is that walk around the laser gate sequence times a hundred. This is the dumbest shit I have ever seen. There is no excuse for this. It's bad, lazy, and then storytelling. It's atrocious. I was going to wait for the whole series to end, but I had to make this video after this scene. I honestly couldn't believe what I was seeing. And then seeing people defend this and make up an excuse? He let Obi-Wan go. He enjoys the chase. I'm not a huge Star Wars fan, but I know a lot of people are. You guys seriously deserve better than this. It's time you start demanding it instead of making up excuses for dumb shit like this just because they showed the character you love the most. It's member berries to the max. If it gets even worse than this, which I'm sure it will, I'm gonna have an aneurysm. Oh hey, Kenobi episode 4 is here. I'm so excited. Now I gotta say, out of the four episodes so far, this one's pretty special. If you haven't seen it yet, don't worry. It's just as diarrhea-inducing in every phase of filmmaking as the previous three episodes were. I learned from the comments in my previous video that discussing the quality of this show with Gatekeeper fans means they kind of come up with different answers. Two plus two, Timmy, what you get? Daddy keeps cash in the walls because he doesn't trust banks. What blows my mind is that this apparently was supposed to be an even longer series than it is, and then it was chopped down to six episodes. Yet they somehow managed to still have a filler episode in this short of a series. Removing the credits and recaps and you get a barely 30 minute episode where essentially nothing of importance happens. Story B opportunities are missed and instead we have a 30 minute episode of stuff happening. Besides the obvious, a big issue with this show is the new characters are absolutely terrible, and we know nothing can happen to Leia or Obi-Wan, so the show has zero tension. Even if a new character dies, which they haven't so far, why would I care? Why would anyone? They're not developed. They're not three-dimensional in any way, shape, or form. I can't even remember their names besides the lead villain, and that's because she's being forced on us. Like her. You must like this character. If you're watching this, I'm going to assume you've seen the show or just don't care and want to hear someone poop on it, so let's go over the lowlights, shall we? At the dick-shaped villainous fortress on Mustafar, the two worst actors in the entire series get to share basically the entire episode together. It's a true joy. The Empire doesn't take kindly to Jedi sympathizer. He Jedi sympathizer. First of all, she's ten fucking years old. Obi-Wan is dead. Oh, all the comments in my previous video about Leia not knowing Obi-Wan and Ben are the same person, so therefore the show doesn't break canon, are wrong. What a surprise. Someone very important to me has been taken. I need your help to get her back. General, I'm sorry, but that's not my problem. Look, if you want my help, you got it. <laughs> what the actual fuck? I love me some bad writing. I really do. Nothing happened here to make him change his mind. Nothing that's natural and not forced. He just does. I don't see any shields. That's because no one would be stupid enough to attack them. Thankfully, the writers knew they'd have to come up with a clever way to bring the shields down, so the Dick Fortress just doesn't have any. No, no, it's hand-waved away instead. Who'd be stupid enough to attack it? I don't know. Looks like you guys do it pretty easily. Also, looks like they're playing the long game with Obi-Wan slowly regaining his Force powers. Is that a character arc they're working toward? Hmm. You think they'll mess that up? I'm here with classified intelligence. Do you know what classified means? Yes, sir. Next, strong female character intimidates Acne Cuck with bullshit dialogue and gets inside. Despite the fact that even beyond her not belonging at the station, she's also been missing for days, but, you know, no big deal. Meanwhile, Obi-Wan swims to some weird singular open watering hole and gets inside. And thankfully, he's bone dry after he hops out. Is this a stare contest? Why do you have to make me hate Leia? What are they keeping down there? Yeah, just keep talking into a fucking comms device next to your enemy. Next up is the best acting I've ever seen. Is the word cringe overused? Well, I'm applying it at least one more time to this awful shit. Nice try, princess. I hope you like pain. SHUT UP! SHUT THE FUCK UP! You guys ready for some member berries? So we have a youngling encased in whatever the fuck this is. Because this is the Inquisitor's little shrine room, or trophy room, if you will, of the Jedi they've killed. Makes sense, yeah? But wait, this kid's clearly meant to be from Episode 3, Revenge of the Sith. Look at his little goofy-ass helmet. So you have to assume that this place was built over 10 years ago, before Order 66. Which means? 
This place has existed for years, even though it belongs to the Inquisitors that were created after Order 66, and Anakin killed this youngling in Revenge of the Sith, preserved him, became Vader, then brought this kid's dead-ass body and encased him here. Or it's just another plot hole created by the writers to give you another one of these. Remember Chewbacca again? Oh, I love to remember Chewbacca. Oh, I remember. It's how an old man and a little girl escaped an Imperial checkpoint on your planet. Wait, what? You're accusing her of incompetence? He's escaped you like a thousand fucking times already. Are you fucking serious? This character sucks. Now let's talk about what I hate the absolute most. Bad. Terrible, no good writing. <laughs> ignoring the inherent silliness, ignoring the shitty editing, this is unfucking forgivable. Have these writers ever heard of the phrase set up and pay off? Even though it's stupid to cuck Obi-Wan and make him a pussified version of himself for the sake of the story, you still did it and set this entire thing up to have a payoff of him regaining his powers. A big aha moment. A moment that you'd probably think would be triumphant. You spent four episodes setting this shit up and even alluded to it at the beginning of this very episode. But as soon as the plot requires him to use his powers, he simply can and does. No character moment, no implied drama of him thinking, oh man, can I do this? Nope, he just does, like he's never had a lapse in power ever. Regardless of storytelling medium, there are certain ways to write a story that should be obvious to anyone, pro or not. And this is fucking terrible. Next up, we have the already infamous Austin Powers scene. Oh, and speeders can now hover. Probably would have been convenient in Empire Strikes Back. Then someone no one gives a shit about dies, strong female character, Obi Cuck, and annoying child actress all get away, and the episode essentially didn't need to exist or happen. I put a tracker on the ship. It seems I have underestimated you. Vader is also apparently ultra forgiving if you plan a tracker on someone as if that somehow makes up for your multiple failings in capturing Obi-Wan. Right. Hey, writers. Go fuck yourself. I'll review the rest of the series because in the end, there's some fun to be had making you guys laugh. But keep in mind what this show is doing to my health. So Reva the Third Sister Episode 5 is upon us. Oh, wait, what's that? You thought this show was called Obi-Wan Kenobi. I don't think so. After this episode's over, the Disney bait and switch is finally complete for this series. You know, the one we all saw coming? This is Reva's show, folks. This shouldn't be a surprise. We were all just kind of waiting for it to hit its apex. And well, here it is. The embarrassingly bad writing continues, don't worry about that. Reva Episode 5 has that in spades. Now some might say, this show has such great ideas though. Yeah, and some people thought using VR was a great idea. But like I've said a million fucking times, it all comes down to execution. Speaking of execution, I wish Vader would execute every character in this shitty series. You know some of the plot holes I pointed out in my previous videos? Well, guess what, folks? They fill in some of them. Man, they sure got me. If only the fill-ins didn't make the characters look even more fucking idiotic. The plot holes that get filled in create even bigger ones and make the most prominent characters in the show look like walking, talking queefs. Alright, the lowlights. Let's just get to it. The show starts out with Obi-Wan fighting Anakin in a flashback. And I just want to congratulate Anakin on being the first 40-year-old looking teenager in history. The tracker worked. No shit. Grand Inquisitor. So she's rewarded for her 80,000th failing because she planted a tracker on someone. I'm sure the ending of this episode will have a brilliant twist to explain why I'm foolish for complaining about this. I'm sure it'll really put me in my place. These writers are so clever. That transport, I need to get her back to Alderaan. Yeah, no shit. And everybody fucking knows it. So why did the tracker matter? Why does it matter so much to pursue Obi-Wan like this? Finding Jedi in these four sensitive people doesn't fucking matter. It was explicitly said in the previous episode that Obi-Wan is the only thing that matters. And since everyone in the fucking galaxy knows that Leia needs to get back to Alderaan, why not just go straight there and wait till you get her back? 
Vader and the Empire knows Obi-Wan's with Leia, so that also means no matter what, Bail Organa's a fucking traitor and should be executed, right? How does this not break Star Wars canon? The hoops people are jumping through to explain this away are putting my brain through a fucking spin cycle. Your head is like a newborn baby, you're trying to... An Imperial destroyer just arrived in orbit above us. She must have tracked us. It's not her, it's Vader. I like that instead of showing actual distress through the idea of impending doom, all of these characters just give a big collective. Oh darn. I'm going to need a ladder. It's not playtime right now, princess. Do as she asks. You trust me, I trust her. What the fuck? Wait, why? This kid hasn't done jack shit that should make Obi-Wan trust her. And she's 10 fucking years old. There shouldn't be any reason to trust her with your lives. She's done nothing but put both of your lives in danger. This is the writers needing to make Leia important. I know he said no communication, but your silence worries me. If you agreed on no contact, why would you have heard from him, you fucking idiot? If I don't hear from you soon, I'll head to Tatooine. Owen will need help with the boy. And oh, need help with the boy. Luke, maybe he would have help if you didn't drag Kenobi away to deal with your problem. Not that the now impotent Kenobi could do shit to protect Luke, but I digress. Ignoring all that bullshit, Reva arrives and we're gonna get to what we've all been waiting for. The bait and switch. Tell the Inquisitor I want to talk. Capturing him is of utmost importance, so you'll indulge this why? Oh, right, right, right. To plot dump. The Knight of Order 66. You were a youngling. That's how you knew you saw him. I was thinking it, and then you fucking said it. I was really curious if anyone thought this was actually a twist or a surprise. So I went on an IGN comments section on Facebook, and yep, this actually surprised people. I'm serious. You're not serving. You're hunting him. Let me help you. Really? She's hunting Vader for killing her friends when she was young. Well then, surely she'll have a clever way of trying to kill him when she gets the chance. Uh, never mind. We'll come back to this, though. I don't need your help. I don't need anyone. <laughs> of course you don't. It's 2022 and it's a Disney series. You're a strong, independent woman, goddammit, and shout it louder for the people in the back! Woo! No! This death got to me almost as much as Wade's. Right behind you. We knew her for at least two and a half episodes. We knew her character so intimately. How does Star Wars even go on after this? It's over. I'm going back. Ah, well thank God she killed herself so you could escape. You're gonna die soon. You're not bringing him to me. I'm bringing him to you. Obi-Wan in his brilliant supporting role decides to help our real main character. The bait and switch is finally complete. There are families back there. Children. Are you gonna let him do it again? Yeah, that's right, Obi-Wan. Appeal to her humanity. You know, because Reva's not a giant piece of shit for everything she's done. Randomly chopping off hands even though the other Inquisitors didn't even want her to do that. Murdering innocent people. Was about to torture and gouge the eyes out of a fucking ten-year-old child. Sounds like she'd really give a flying fuck about awful things happening to your people. This looks cool and also creates about a thousand plot holes. Like, maybe he could have, at the very least, gotten Obi-Wan regardless of that fire at the end of episode 3? But he loves the chase! That's probably my favorite fanboy excuse I heard regarding the bad writing for this series, and I'm never letting that one go. Why didn't you just grab the second ship? Is your fucking force meter depleted? Or is this another the fire is too big situation? Did you just let him go this time too? Same excuse as before? I can hear it now. He let Obi-Wan and the others fly away. He really loves the chase. <laughs> ah, this was her big plan all along. Swing her saber at him when he's not distracted whatsoever. All this planning and this is what you came up with? <laughs> Look.
Looks cool, but why the fuck would Vader indulge any of this? Did you really believe I did not see it, youngling? Your rage was useful. Really? Really? You knew all along. So Vader's gone from Captain Doesn't Fuck Around to playing fucking games with his subordinates? Since when? When was he ever characterized like this? And what usefulness are you talking about? She's been fucking useless to you. She's done nothing but burden your search, make things more difficult. Keeping her alive and indulging her bullshit doesn't help you in any way. No, this has been nothing but a plot requirement. This is and then storytelling. If he's known this all along, there's nothing she's done for him that the real Grand Inquisitor couldn't have done too. In fact, he probably would have Kenobi by now if you didn't indulge her shit. And apparently getting stabbed by a lightsaber doesn't mean jack shit now. Grand Inquisitor's fine. Reva's fucking fine. Twice over. Qui-Gon is... Oh. Oh shit. And of course, they're just going to conveniently leave her there instead of just fucking killing her because plot armor. The next video will be made from my hospital bed. One more episode. Kenobi episode 6 has arrived, and if you care about good writing, just know This is shit! This is a table of shit! After watching this final episode, I realized it was a bad week to have finally caught Top Gun Maverick. It might seem weird to compare because these two pieces of media are vastly different, but not when you look under the hood. What they share is trying to be legacy stories that are follow-ups to older, successful projects that they hope audiences want to see again, using nostalgia to get you back in front of the screen. This has been a theme in Hollywood for 7 or 8 years now, with varying levels of success, and can Kenobi and Top Gun Maverick represent the two extremes of the spectrum. When the consensus for why Top Gun's good is because of how emotionally impactful the story is, but the consensus for why Episode 6 of Kenobi's good is because... Oh my god, the cameos. Vader versus Kenobi. He said hello there. You have a problem. Throwbacks and nostalgia should add to a great story, not be the sole reason you're watching it. And Kenobi is nostalgia in meltdown mode. The Chernobyl of shiny keys. A fucking super volcano of member berries. Kenobi Episode 6 should absolutely please fans that just want to see Vader, lightsaber duels, and hear one-liners from movies past. But don't count on it to be a finale to a coherent story or become invested in any of the characters because of what's going on in front of you. No, no. The writers in Disney will rely on your need for nostalgia for that. And so I bring Top Gun back in. It's filled with nostalgia, but it uses throwbacks, callbacks, and shiny keys as the gravy on top of a gripping, emotionally charged story. Top Gun gets you invested in its characters and events transpiring on the screen, so when the member berries drop, they're just added goodness to something that's great all on its own. Meanwhile, you have Obi-Wan Kenobi, a show that uses nostalgia strictly as a means for its very existence. An assembly line style product that feels cheaply made, poorly directed, terribly written, and just another reason to shove Darth Vader back in your face and get subscribers for a streaming service without any actual care given to nurture and develop a great story. There are no real payoffs to setups, there are new plot holes created with every episode, characters are given unearned endings to their arcs, and the finale has epitomized the look at the shiny keys attitude of the script. And from a a lot of responses it seems most people are fine with that which is all well and good and if that's your thing cool it's just not mine let's dive into the lowlights one last time Looks like Vader's caught up to that ship pretty fast, but decides to play the spaceship chase equivalent to the Leia chase scene in episode 1 and stay just out of arm's reach Wait your turn You can have what's left when I'm done Reva's fine I guess a lightsaber isn't deadly, more just a tummy ache on par with Taco Bell. She'll come when the suns go down. Best we got position now. Apparently, Amber is a brilliant tactician out of nowhere, and Owen the poor scrub is along for the ride. While Reva's on Tatooine looking to kill Luke, Obi-Wan decides to get this story over with and lands on another planet that looks exactly like Tatooine because the budget's so low. Then you will die. After five episodes of setting up this fight, where Obi-Wan was essentially unable to use the Force just a few episodes ago, he can now go full-on beast mode against Vader. I'm not a fan of the idea of depowering Obi-Wan to build him up again, but that's what the writers decided to do. What they fail at is the payoff to that setup. 
I mentioned this in my episode 4 review when Obi-Wan could barely move a scrap of metal at the beginning of the episode, and then could stop glass from shattering against an ocean of water pressure 5 seconds later. They didn't have proper setup and payoff there either, he was just able to do that because the plot needed him to. This is that moment gone supersonic. There was absolutely no triumphant moment that Obi-Wan was put into where he recognized his powers coming back, where he questioned it in the moment of absolute peril. He simply does what the plot needs him to do. This is a complete disregard for your character's arc. This moment should feel triumphant, but it's completely unearned, and things carry more weight when they are earned. But hey, ignore that. Just look at the shiny keys. Look at the lightsabers. Look at Vader. Look how cool he is. If you can actually see anything in this poorly lit scene. Your strength has returned. Yep, that's right. It just has. Just like that, it's returned without any character moment for him or the audience to appreciate. It's here because the plot needs it to be. And that is why you will always lose. Vader does a fucking Hulk smash. I am the king and you're just a pawn. Who's got the high ground now, Obi-Wan? You have failed, master. At least Vader is consistent within the series itself. Instead of pursuing things to the end and killing someone he's been in desperate pursuit of, he just leaves them alone once he has them in his grasp. Obi-Wan pulls a Peter Parker and escapes the rubble, I guess. Kenobi apparently collected all the Chaos Emeralds real quick and beats the shit out of Vader while he stands there and just kind of lets him. Huh. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Anakin. This is some really great acting by Ewan McGregor, honestly. What a wasted performance. You didn't kill Anakin Skywalker. I did. The writers of this show are arrogant enough to think they need to fix a perceived plot hole in the original trilogy. A young Jedi named Darth Vader, who was a pupil of mine until he turned to evil. He betrayed and murdered your father. I guess this television show creating 8,000 new plot holes is worth it. I will destroy you. And my friend is truly dead. Okay, then just fucking kill him. You can do it! Cut his fucking head off! Since Vader obviously has to live, I question why the writers felt they needed to write themselves into a corner like this. Why not write the scene differently? Meh. Whatever. Get the fuck out of here trying to redeem this character. She's participated in killing men, women, and younglings, but this time, she can't? Stories are made to manipulate audience emotions, but I don't understand how anyone could suspend disbelief in this moment. Considering her actions before, this is absurd. Plot contrivance counter has reached 8 trillion. I failed him. He killed them all and I couldn't do it. You're a terrible human being. Oh, well, oh, you're crying. Oh, well, you're forgiven now. Have I become him? No. You've chosen not to. Well, yeah, actually. You've done despicable, horrible things. You're a piece of shit. Sparing one kid while participating in the murder of many people over years doesn't redeem you. But what the fuck do I know? Will I ever see you again? If you ever need help from a tired old man, no one must know, or it could endanger us both. Plot hole filled? Is this how they're getting around Leia clearly not personally knowing Obi-Wan in the OT? General Kenobi, years ago you served my father in the Clone Wars. Go fuck yourself. Not to mention the entire Empire knows Bail Organa, Leia, and Obi-Wan are all connected. You can't keep me here. My father is Bail Organa. He's a senator. I am a princess of Alderaan. So Bail and all of them should be known traitors to the Empire. But again, what the fuck do I know? Dan? You want to meet him? Hello there. Remember when he says hello there? Oh, I love that. That's fantastic. And for the final member, Barry, Qui-Gon arrives to ask Obi-Wan how the fuck Reva was the one who survived a lightsaber to the gut. Kenobi answers truthfully. Because she's the new strong female character, you dumbass. And with that, the series concludes. It's finally over. But once more, my thoughtful analysis on this show is... It's shit. It is a table of shit. GG's only.